11th of May 1942, two long range Japanese submarines, the I 25 and I 26, departed Yokosuka, Japan for the west coast of North America. In part one of this series, we saw how the Japanese submarine I 17 had launched an audacious deck gun bombardment of the Elwood Oil Refinery in California on the 23rd of February 1942 and helped to trigger the infamous Los Angeles air raid two days later. Now, two more Japanese submarines were coming to directly attack the North American mainland. The I 25 was equipped with an onboard reconnaissance aircraft, the Okoska E 14 Y 1 float plane codenamed the Glen by the Allies, carried with wings folded up inside a waterproof hangar forward of the conning tower and launched by a catapult mounted on deck. The aircraft was retrieved by landing in the sea beside the submarine and being hauled aboard by a crane. The I 26's hangar was empty. They initially played a role in the Japanese attack on Midway, specifically the diversionary attack on Dutch Harbor, Alaska, designed to draw American aircraft carriers and other warships away from Midway. On the 27th of May, the I 25's float plane, piloted by Chief Warrant Officer Nobuo Fujita, conducted a successful reconnaissance flight over Kodiak Island, spotting an American cruiser and two destroyers. After the successful recovery of Fujita, the I 26's hangar had been kept empty just in case the I 25 had been unable to recover the float plane. The I 25 sailed on down the west coast of America, arriving off the coast of Oregon on the 14th of June. While off the Oregon coast, the I 25 launched a series of false submarine periscopes constructed of painted bamboo, which were mounted on special submerged rafts designed to confuse local American anti submarine forces that were conducting regular patrols along the coast. On the 18th of June, Lieutenant Commander Tagami, commanding officer of the I 25, received new instructions from Rear Admiral Yamazaki. Ordering him to attack American military targets along the west coast by shelling them with his deck gun. The I 26 received the same instructions at the same time and went on to attack the Estevan Point Lighthouse in Canada on the evening of the 20th of June. Vancouver Island forms part of the huge Canadian province of British Columbia, lying in the Pacific Northwest. The shoreline is dotted with numerous lighthouses that have for generations guided the local fishing fleets, as well as trans Pacific telegraph stations vital to late 19th through to mid 20th century international communications. Estevan Point Lighthouse was constructed in 1909 and is one of the oldest Euro Canadian structures in the region, standing in 1942 close to a local Indian settlement. It was a relatively remote area, little affected by the Pacific War, but all that was rudely shattered in the late evening of the 20th of June 1942 by the Japanese submarine I 26. Commander Minuro Yokota surfaced his boat approximately two miles out at sea, directly off the lighthouse, and ordered his gunners to pump shells at the building in the hope of toppling the structure. Yokota's shelling of the lighthouse at Estevan Point has come under historical scrutiny in Canada, and the lighthouse attack has become a controversial issue. According to the Canadian government, the I 26 fired between 20 and 30 140 mm rounds from her deck gun at the lighthouse, but caused almost no damage before leaving the area after an hour sitting on the surface offshore. There are those who doubt whether the attack was the work of the Japanese, and these conspiracy theorists have suggested that the shells actually originated from an American ship or submarine and intentionally failed to cause any material damage. The harmless attack was made, according to the revisionists, in an effort to bolster Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King's Liberal government that found itself in the midst of a controversial move to implement conscription in Canada. Historians writing in Canada's foremost history magazine, The Beaver, suggest quote, The timing of the submarine attack seems like a stroke of phenomenal luck for King, the Liberal Party, and possibly even the continued unity of Canada. Or was the timing a little too perfect?、Unquote. 
The authors note that the debate on the controversial conscription bill was at that moment raging in Parliament in Ottawa. Quote, Perhaps a discreet enemy incident of the manufactured sort was just the thing needed to galvanise Canadian public opinion towards the kind of all-out effort needed to justify overseas conscription. Unquote. According to post-war statements made by Commander Yokota, skipper of the I-26, his chief gunner took aim on the lighthouse at a range of two miles and commenced firing at 10.15pm on the 20th of June. Although approximately 20 to 30 shells, accounts vary, were fired at the very prominent and tall target, not a single round struck either the lighthouse or the nearby Indian settlement. This incredibly poor gunnery has provided conspiracy theorists with evidence for an American firing the shots instead, and deliberately missing the human habitation and important navigational beacon while posing as an enemy intruder. Commander Yokota explained that the appalling marksmanship of his gunners was because of the dark. Our gun crew had difficulty in making the shots effective, he wrote. The revisionist historians who challenge the very presence of the I-26 point out that even at the time of the attack, 10.15pm on a late June evening at such a latitude, it would still have been light enough to read a newspaper. They also suggest that Yokota was, quote, honour bound to corroborate any official statement made by the newly established authorities, the victorious allies, unquote. There are certainly some inconsistencies that have allowed doubts as to the veracity of the attack to creep into the frame. The lighthouse keeper, Robert Lally, made a note in his log during the attack of two warships firing on Estevan Point from two different directions. In all later government reports, the warships were reduced to one submarine. The official report submitted by the senior Canadian naval officer in the Pacific to the government in Ottawa in July 1942 stated that the bombardment, quote, was in all probability carried out by one submarine mounting 5.5-inch guns forward of the sub's conning tower, unquote. However, Japanese I-class submarines such as the I-26 were fitted with a single 140mm or 5.5-inch gun mounted behind the conning tower. American submarines, on the other hand, matched the Canadian officer's description of the offending vessel perfectly, and American boats were the only other submarines operating in that region at that time. On the 3rd of July 1973, an unexploded Japanese Navy 140mm shell was discovered close to Estevan Point. This physical hard evidence of the Japanese attack goes some way to disproving some sort of elaborate subterfuge being played out on the Canadians by the United States in order to solidify Canada's resolve regarding a full commitment to the war in Europe. The debate over the Estevan Point attack may rumble on for many years to come, with the truth remaining elusive. Yokota went to his grave adamant that he had indeed shelled Canadian soil and performed the mission he had been assigned. The very same night that the I-26 shelled Estevan Point, the I-25 torpedoed the British freighter Fort Camazon, 70 miles south-southeast of Cape Flattery. The sinking wasn't straightforward, as a distress call brought two Royal Canadian Navy corvettes to the scene. The I-25 slunk away, but then it turned up at the mouth of the Columbia River. Japanese naval intelligence had informed the I-25 skipper that there was a US Navy submarine base located at the port of Astoria, close to the river mouth. However, lying between the I-25 and her intended target was the huge Fort Stevens. Work had begun on constructing Fort Stevens in 1863, the middle of the American Civil War. Something needed to be done to protect the entrance to the Columbia, and the result was the construction of three forts named Stevens, Columbia, and Canby. Although not to see any action during the Civil War, Fort Stevens nevertheless provided a formidable obstacle for any seaborne raider attempting to penetrate the Columbia River. Time passed, and the weapons at the three forts were progressively upgraded and modernised. The defences were never tested for real, until Commander Tagami and the I-25 hove into view the night of the 21st of June 1942. Fort Stevens was fitted with many types and calibres of artillery, 
all of it dating from the turn of the century. There were 6-inch and 8-inch guns, and 12-inch mortars. One of the most novel weapons mounted on the fort were 10-inch rifles, a particularly impressive gun. Each time the weapon was fired, the barrel would recoil backwards to an automatic locking point, which meant that the weapon actually disappeared inside its embrasure, allowing the crew to reload the rifle out of sight of the enemy. Not surprisingly, this weapon was nicknamed the Disappearing Rifle. Fort Stevens contained enough firepower to stand off a Japanese fleet let alone a single puny submarine armed with nothing more impressive than a 140mm deck gun. Protecting the mouth of the Columbia was a ring of electrically controlled mines anchored below the water's surface at selected depths. A total of 156 mines were arranged into 12 groups of 13, each group linked to a control room in the fort by cables. A final deterrent to a potential enemy were Sperry searchlights mounted on the fort. Each searchlight was enormously powerful, able to illuminate a ship at a maximum range of 6 to 8 miles, doubly important to the fort because it lacked radar. Sunday the 21st of June was the longest day of the year. The air was warm as the I-25 slowly and discreetly trailed fishing boats heading into the approaches to the Columbia River in the darkness. A myriad of lights twinkled and glittered from the shore, indicating to the Japanese officers on the conning tower the town of either Astoria or Seaside. The wind was a mere four knots, which meant that the sea was calm, and therefore Warrant Officer Sensuke Tao, the boat's chief gunner, should not have encountered undue difficulties hitting his target. Indeed, down on the deck, Tao was overseeing his gunners as they prepared the weapon for action the barrel pointing up at 30 to 40 degrees, all ready to begin pumping rounds onto the American shore. As the I-25 silently drifted across the entrance to the Columbia River, approximately 20,000 yards offshore, the troops manning the batteries expected another quiet and uneventful watch. Commander Tagami gave the order to commence firing, as the first Japanese shells began exploding around Fort Stevens, all hell broke loose. Soon the night air already rent by the whistle and loud bangs of the incoming Japanese shells was further disturbed by the mournful wail of the siren as troops rushed to man their positions and prepare to return fire. Fort Stevens, however, was destined not to fire a single shot in reply to the I-25's bold attack. The senior duty officer at the group fire control station in charge of ordering the batteries to fire, Captain Robert Houston, refused to give the order. As far as Houston could tell, there were three problems that prevented him from unleashing the fort's considerable firepower at the Japanese interloper. Firstly, from the distant muzzle flash of the Japanese deck gun, Houston estimated that the enemy vessel was approximately 20,000 yards from the fort. Although the 10-inch rifles mounted on the fort were much more potent weapons than the puny Japanese gun, the antiquated nature of the fort's armament meant that the rifles could only shoot a maximum of 16,200 yards. Secondly, the enemy vessel appeared to be moving and firing, and Houston lacked radar with which to accurately control his fall of shot onto the target, assuming the enemy vessel came within range. Thirdly, and perhaps rather ignominiously, Houston believed that if he ordered the batteries to open fire, the Japanese would easily pinpoint the muzzle flashes from the big 10-inch rifles and begin a form of counter-battery fire on the fort's main armament. As the rifles were out of range, the Japanese gunners could have hit the American gunners with impunity. In the meantime, confused American gunners stood by their weapons, wondering when on earth their officers would issue the order to open fire. Morale began to plummet among the ordinary American soldiers as Japanese shells continued to impact around the fort. The lack of an American response to the Japanese shells was not helpful to the I-25's gunners. Although there were lights ashore, the Japanese had little idea of what they were actually shooting at and simply poured shells in the general direction of Fort Stevens. The I-25 fired 17 shells, causing only superficial damage ashore, before quietly departing the area and heading for Yokosuka in Japan, 
However, the Japanese were not quite finished with the American West Coast just yet. The I-25's pilot, Chief Warrant Officer Fujita, has submitted a plan to launch a daring aerial attack on the US West Coast. In part three of this series, we will find out how Fujita was able to launch not one, but two airstrikes on America. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. You can also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton, details below. And also consider supporting both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.